my son is really good at throwing darts. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, with that video, there were in the building over 650 people um, that were here on last Sunday night. And of that 650, there were over, I believe, over 250 that had no church uh, home that, that they are a part of on Sundays. And they came and joined with us. But it was a success because everybody just did their job. You know, because we had a group of people that sat out here on the back of their cars and just handed out candy at a trunk or treat, because there was a, a group that sat here at registration tables and just filled out registration, because we had a group that was in the gym and they just ran a booth, but because each one of us just did our job, it allowed a whole other group of us to not have a specific job and to just be able to go around and talk with people. That's why it was successful, folks. Every one of us just did our job. This video that we just watched, um, I had a laugh. I asked Steve Robinson, we'd asked him before Sunday if he would take pictures and, uh, and then put something together. And he said, well, how long do you want the video to be? And I said, oh, three minutes. Uh, folks, that video was three minutes, zero seconds, point zero zero seconds. I, I had to laugh at it. I think next time I'm going to give him something crazy, you know, like two minutes, 42 seconds, and, you know, 42 and seven tenths seconds and see if he can hit that. Um, but did a great job putting that together. But again, it's that idea. As a church, we operate when each one of us does our job that God has called us to. If you've got a Bible today, turn to Luke chapter 16. We're going to pick up reading in verse 14. Now we are coming to some, some sayings of Jesus that if I had not foolishly made this commitment when I started preaching, that I was going to, before I retire, I was going to preach through every verse in the Bible. I, I come today to a passage where I go, I wish I had not said that. Because if I had not said that, we would just skip right over this section. Because there is some hard sayings, there's some strange sayings, and then there's one that I don't even want to touch. But because I made a commitment to myself and to God to preach through the entire Bible, we're going to hit it. We've got a Bible, Luke chapter 16. We're going to start reading verse 14. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this, and were sneering at Jesus. Don't you just love the way that Luke writes that? And I love the way the NIV translates it. it the, the Pharisees who love money heard all this. What they hear? Well, they heard what Jesus has already said in, in the previous parables. If you want to look at those, read back up and, and see what he's saying there. But then he says, they sneered at Jesus. Man, that's harsh. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people highly value is detestable in God's sight. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. Okay, there's one of them that I would have liked to have skipped. Uh, because that is strange. It's kind of weird. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to make of this. We'll talk about it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And, for the, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. But there is one that I didn't even want to touch. But we're going to talk about it today. And hopefully when we are done... You won't be mad at me. And I will say this. If, if you're mad at what I said, if you don't like what I said, we can talk. Because I am fallible. If you just don't like what Luke wrote and what Jesus said, don't come grab at me. Because I can't change that. Okay? And God put that into his word. And there's got to be a reason. 
And so if you don't like what Jesus said, you don't have a problem with me. You've got a problem with Jesus. And you can go take it up with him. If you've got a problem with what I say about it, then yes, please, we can sit down and talk about that. So let's dig into these hard sayings. Because, and I want to say, I grouped them all together today. Not because there's anything that like takes you from one of these sayings into the next one and into the next one. Uh, there's, uh, there's not like this unifying thread that, that is part of each teaching that, oh, there it is. I put them all together because the one thing that I think they all have in common is they point to each of us our need for forgiveness. You and I need forgiveness. And as we go through these, I think we're going to begin to understand that. The first <coughs> sinful attitude that Jesus attacks to the Pharisees stems from money. Now the Pharisees were, they were part of the, the money class. They weren't the richest. I must say the Pharisees were like lower upper class or upper middle class. That's kind of what we would say to them. They had plenty of money. They weren't in danger of starving or anything like that. They had enough money that they would have a little bit of leisure time. Why do I say they have a little bit of leisure time? To be a Pharisee, you had all of these rules and regulations that you had to follow. If you were always scraping to get by, you wouldn't be able to have the time to follow all the rules and regulations that the Pharisees did. And so the Pharisees had some money. They weren't the wealthiest. But, but they had some money, they had some leisure time. And so, but as, as Paul, as Luke says, they loved money. They loved money. For them, it came down to money became their God. Now, let me first say this though. You don't have to be wealthy to love money. Many of us would sit here and we would say, you know, I'm not in the wealthy group. Oh, really? Do you have adequate housing? Do you have a roof over your head that when, and, and, uh, when it gets cold in the winter, which I know it doesn't do very often here, but occasionally it does. When it gets cold in the winter, do you have the ability to warm it up? When it's really hot in the summer, which it does a lot, do you have the ability to cool that house down? If you do, just that bare minimum, a, a roof over your head, the ability to warm it up in the winter and cool it down in the summer, probably puts you in like the top 5% of the world's wealth. Folks, you and I are 5%ers. Do you have one car that when you go out, and you put the key in the ignition and you turn the ignition, you're pretty confident that every time I turn this key, the car is going to start? Well, that bumps you up. If you have two of those, two cars that are reliable, it puts us into like the top 2%. So you and I are 2%ers in the world's wealth. If you have any money in a bank account, any money in a bank account, any, any kind of security net, any kind of retirement account, it probably puts us into the top 1%. So congratulations. You are filthy, stinking rich. What's wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with being wealthy. What's wrong is when, our, when we begin to view money as the end or when we begin to view money as the opportunity to just buy more stuff for me, money becomes our God. And when money becomes our God, we need to get down on our knees and we need to say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. You see, the Pharisees began, began to view money as the end. They began to view money as what they, they were going for. That was the goal, was to get more money. When we begin to see money as the end or the thing that we are reaching for and grasping for, 
that it is a sin. And we need to ask God's forgiveness. We need to view money as the means that God gives to provide for our families and to accomplish His work. Folks, that's what it's about. Money is what God has given us to utilize for His kingdom. And many times people will ask, you know, Grant, how, how can I know that God is, is happy with my giving? Well, I'm going to tell you, I really think that's the wrong question. Now, here's the easy answer. If you're not tithing, if you're not giving 10% of your income back to God, don't even bother wait, asking the question. Because if you're not giving at least 10% of your income back to God through the church, then you are not following the biblical commands. And if you're not doing that, God isn't going to be happy with your giving. It's as simple as that. Got a problem with it? Go argue with God, not me. But that's the wrong question. Because that's the easy one. The right question is, is God pleased with how I utilize the other 90%? We get so caught up on the 10%. Or is God pleased with how much I give? But we don't recognize that what God really wants is what do you do with the other 90? And I'm not saying that you've got to go give all your money to the church. But it is how do you utilize the other 90% of the money that God has given you? How do you utilize those resources? Do you just spend them all on yourselves? Or do you invest those in God's kingdom? Do you utilize your resources in a wise financial stewardship or man financial management plan? If we can't come back and say that we are utilizing all 100% of the financial resources that God has given us in a way that would be pleasing to Him. And the reality is, we love money more than we love God. And we need to get down on our knees and we need to say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. The Pharisees needed to do it. You and I needed to do it. And money is not security. But Jim Bishop wrote, he's a columnist, he reported, wrote an article on people that had won the lottery. Of one lady, he says, uh, named Rose, Rosa Grayson. She won a state lottery that gave her $400 a week for life. Now, she hides in her apartment. Had never been afraid to go out. Now, she hides in her apartment. As she says, for the first time in her life, she has nerves. She went on to say that for the first, she said now that everywhere she goes, people are wanting to put the touch on her for money. That was her words. They want to put the touch on me. Everywhere she went. Another family by the name of the McGugarts from New York. They won the Irish sweepstakes. Uh, the dad, Pop, was a steam fitter. Johnny was 26, loaded crates on docks. Tim was going to night school. Pop won the money, but he split the million with his sons. A year later, the million wasn't gone. It was bent. The boys weren't speaking to Pop or each other. Johnny was chasing expensive racehorses. Tim was catching up with expensive girls. Mom accused Pop of, of hiding his part from her. Within two years, all of them were in court for non-payment of income taxes. All of these people hoped and prayed for sudden wealth. They had their prayers answered. And all were wrecked on a dollar sign. Folks, if we love money more than God, we need to ask His forgiveness. The second one, the second attitude that Jesus condemned the Pharisees on was seeing themselves righteous. Self-justification. They believed that their commitment to obeying the law made them righteous. They, just, they believed that because they did all of these good things, that they were righteous and that God was pleased with them. What do we mean when we say they did all the good things? Well, let's put it into modern terms. The Pharisees, most of us pastors, would give our right arm to have a church full of them. 
Why? Well, because you could guarantee that they were going to tithe. Jesus says that they tithe down to the mint, cumin, and dill. These are these little bitty herbs and spices that you can hardly see. That they would count those out. They were meticulous. They made sure that they gave their 10%. Well, I'm going to tell you. You get, you get a church where every single person gives 10%, you're going to have more money than you know what to do with. And so most every pastor would love to have a church full of them. And they were also the kind that they were there every single Sunday. If there were four Sundays in a month, well, the Pharisees would be there five. I mean, they did not miss. They did not miss church. They didn't miss Sunday night. They didn't miss Wednesday night. If you wanted to throw in an extra service, they were going to be there. You would always have a full house when you had a bunch of Pharisees. Most every preacher, wouldn't y'all kind of like that? To know that every time we have church, our entire membership is going to be there. Not ever going to miss. That's the Pharisees. You never had to worry about getting called down to the police station to go visit one of your church members if you have a church full of Pharisees. Because they don't break laws. You know, they don't ever do anything wrong. They were you're just perfect. Problem is, the Pharisees knew it. They knew that they followed all the commands, they followed all the laws. Uh, they knew that, that they did everything the way it should be done. But in doing so, they began to justify themselves. That means, too, they sought to demonstrate their righteousness before others by external behavior. And they believed that all they had to do was do everything right. And they were good. What happened is they forgot to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. And to love their neighbor as themselves. They forgot the great commandment. You see, they began to say that they were good enough. But the reality is they weren't good enough. The danger for all of us is we sometimes do the same thing. Sometimes we get to a point where we begin to think that we are good enough. Well, folks, we're not. We're not good enough. Because somewhere along the line, we are going to mess up. And if we justify, if we justify ourselves before God based on who we are, you're never going to match up. But yet we do it. So often, man, we feel better than other people. We look down on others because, well, I behave better than you do. Or, or I tithe better than you do. Or I attend church but more than you do. Or, or, or you speed and I don't. Whatever it is. You know, whatever I can look at you and say, well, I'm better at this than you are. You know, I, I, don't, I don't yell and scream from the stands on the weekends. Um, I, I don't, whatever. When we begin to look at others and place ourselves above them. We need to get on our knees before our Father and say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. The third one, verse 16. Jesus says in verse 16, I'm going to read it exactly. He says to, the, to them that everyone is forcing their way into it. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Now I want to tell you, I read this passage and, and I thought, okay, how can I just skip right over it? Because I have no idea what this means that everyone is forcing their way into the kingdom of God. I thought Jesus talked a lot about being peaceful. And now he's saying everybody's forcing their way into the kingdom of God. I just started scratching my head thinking, I don't understand this. What does this mean? Well, I started looking like I would tell you to do. Look before, look after. Figure out what's the context. What's, what, is, what is happening? What's being said right before that and right after that? 
Well, right before you, he's talking about the prophets. And then right after that, he talks about the permanence of God's Word. And so I began to go, okay, wow, that doesn't really help me a whole lot. It does a little bit. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I went to the commentary, went to all these books that I've studied. And, and I read this statement. And I thought, man, that is it. It said that everyone has to make a violent, decisive decision to enter the kingdom. Everyone has to make a decisive decision to enter the kingdom. When Jesus says that everyone is forcing their way into it, I think what he is meaning, you can get some Greek language stuff there. I'm not going to bore you with all that. But it can be read in such a way that every one of us has to make a very forceful and a complete decision to be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is that decision? That decision is to place everything about myself behind me. And to give myself completely over to God. It is a decision to love God more than anything else. It is a decision to place Him number one in my life. And everything is so far behind Him, number two, that it's not even worth looking at. That is a decisive decision. You and I have to come to a point where we set everything aside and nothing is important except for our love for God. We have to make that decision. And that is a decisive decision. And then Jesus follows the statement up by talking about the permanence of God's Word. And, and as I began to think about this, what, what really struck me is that Jesus is telling the Pharisees that you love your laws more than you love me. That for them, the, the laws of God the commands, the scripture, were more important to them than was God himself. And he condemned them for it. For us, having a love for God's word that eclipses our love for, him, for God himself is a sin. Now hear me very clear. Loving God's word is not a sin. But desiring to get into God's Word is not a sin. That is a great thing. And I encourage you to read His Word. I encourage you to love the Word of God. But if we begin to get to a point where God's Word is more important than God Himself, then we need to get on our knees before our holy God and say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. Treasuring God's Word must never replace our love and trust in God. The Pharisees had gotten to a place where they began to value God's Word, His commands, more than they loved God. And it is so easy for us to do the same thing. And when we do, we need to be forgiven. It brings us to the very last one. The one that I freely would say, I would love to skip over. I would love to not see it even in here. Because it's a hard teaching. As I read it, I have tried so many times in the past to give all kinds of excuses and, and all kinds of other reasons. But let's just go back to what it says. Jesus says, anyone who divorces and remarries commits adultery. Matthew adds some accepting cases of language. It is interesting that Luke does not. Now, Luke does the same in some other places where he is, where he and Jesus, he and Matthew quote Jesus, saying basically the same thing. There's some other places where Matthew adds some different stuff and, and Luke doesn't. But Luke doesn't add any insect except of cases. He doesn't give you any outs. He just says, anyone who divorces and remarries commits adultery. We all know adultery is sin. 
So as I read these passages, my question is, why would Jesus say something so harsh? Didn't he know that there was going to be a time period, man, where there's going to be a lot of people that, that got divorced, a lot of people that got divorced through no fault of their own, a, a lot of people that, that married when they shouldn't have, and, and they got divorced because they both grew up and realized what they were doing to each other. You know, I, I mean, didn't Jesus realize these things? Why would he say something so harsh? I came down to this. Jesus wanted us to recognize our need for repentance and forgiveness. Jesus wanted you and I and I'm going to put all of us in it. We're going to show, I'm going to show you how in just a minute. All of us need God's forgiveness. Every single one of us needs God's forgiveness. Why do I say that? Well, when you got married, you probably got married, many of you got married right here. But you got married in a building like this, a stage something like this, you stood in front of somebody like me, a preacher. And the preacher talked for a while, and then the preacher got to a point where he said, I'm going to ask you to join hands, and, and I'm going to ask you to repeat your vows after me. And he put it, he, he began to talk through those vows. He used words like richer for poor, sickness and health, and what? Till death do us part. We call them vows. They are promises. They are commitments. And when you stood on that platform looking into your partner, and you looked at your husband and your wife to be, and you say that I promise to not leave you until death do us part, we always think, yes, I'm making that vow to my wife. Or to my husband. And that is absolutely true. But there is somebody else that you made that vow to. You made that vow to God Almighty. And when your marriage fell apart, you broke a vow, a commitment to God Himself. And that is sin. And all those of us who sin, are in need of God's forgiveness. We need to ask God to forgive us. Now many of you are like me, and you're saying, okay, Grant, I guess I'm off the hook there. Really? I've been married 23 years. Fortunately, my wife is going to, I think, put up with me. I think she's going to stick it out with me. Don't ask me why, but you know, she's, I think she's going to. And so I could say, boy, I've got it made there. Okay, I do on that part. But remember I said, you stood and you made a commitment not just to your spouse-to-be, but you made a commitment to God in heaven. Okay? Folks, I may have done pretty good or okay, and I'm going to make it on that I made a commitment to my wife, to Denise, that, that I'm going to stay with her until death do us part. I, I've done pretty good on that. And, and I have fulfilled to this point that vow to God. Some of those. My wife might disagree with me on some of those. But. but how many other times have I made a commitment to God and then failed? You just don't know because it's not as visible. You see, when I fail on that commitment, if I fail on the commitment to stay with my wife and to love my wife until death do us part, it's pretty visible. It's pretty visible when I have to move out of the house. But if I make a commitment to God on so many other things, and I promise God, oh God, I will do this, and then I fall and I falter, you may not see it. But folks, that's just as much a sin as divorcing my wife and going forward. And so, I am in need 
of forgiveness. I need to get on my knees before a righteous and holy Father in heaven and say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. Each and every one of us has failed to live up to our commitments to God. And we need God's forgiveness. And so if you want to cast stones at those that have been remarried, go right ahead and make sure you are perfect and faultless. Make sure that you've never treated your wife poorly. Make sure that you have never failed on a commitment to God. All of you, all of us that have failed in our commitments to God, we need to set our stones down. We need to go to each and every one of us and say, you know what? I have failed. I need God's forgiveness. As we look at that passage, that is what I hope you remember. I hope that you remember that you need God's forgiveness. That I need God's forgiveness. And I may not have messed up in that area, but I have plenty of others. So, I need God's forgiveness. In your connection card, I put three things. 